Hi everybody, welcome to the Peterson Online Vault Tours. My name is Michaela and I'm gonna be walking you through the vault today. So let's go ahead and get started. We have a bit of a walk here to get to our starting point. So as we are walking, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we will have tours kind of coming out throughout the weeks. Some will be filmed, some will just be general. Please go online to the website to find any kind of scheduling so you can see what will be coming out. Um, anything we're walking past right now that looks interesting to you, uh, just remember it will be covered on another tour coming up. Um, again, you can just check the website for any information about what those themes are. Today our theme is actually going to be post-war automobiles. And so we are looking at um, how the war, coming out of the war basically is going to change production, how the automobiles have changed, and we're going to be using some of the cars that we have down here in the vault today to kind of walk through that story. So basically during the war, everyone is going to retool and become um, war factories. They're building airplanes, tanks, boats. They're not building cars. And so what you have coming out of the war is a huge gap. Um, and it's gonna take the big three some time to start coming out with new designs. But eventually you will get things like our 56 Corvette here. We have a 55 Ford Thunderbird down here. So Corvette, Thunderbird are gonna come out at the same time and we'll walk through that story, but keep these cars kind of in mind. The other thing you're gonna have um, coming out of World War II is the rise of some of these European companies that we know really well, like Ferrari, 1947. So that's the 125S over there, um, as well as things like Porsche and some of these other smaller European companies. So keep those cars in mind. Um, and as we move out here, we're actually gonna kind of get deep into our story. So what you see, like I said, during the war, everybody's gonna pause production. And coming out of the war, you really have the big three who have no idea what new designs they're gonna come out with. They have no cars to sell, but there's a huge demand for vehicles. And so what you actually see a lot of the companies do is take their old models from the 30s and early, way early 40s and retool them. You get a lot more chrome, um, basically just kind of a styling change. This is a Lincoln Sedanka. Um, and so you're seeing kind of that 30s vehicle um, kind of get retooled. One of the things that's significant about this car is if you actually look at the trunk, um, it does not have a Continental kit. So most cars at this point, you would actually have that spare tire in the back that said Continental all the way around the side, and this vehicle is lacking that. So one of the many changes that they would actually kind of do to a car like this, um, you will then eventually see the big three are going to catch up and they are going to start making what everybody wants, which at the time is sports cars. So you get the Corvette, which comes out from Chevy in 1953. You get the Thunderbird from Ford in 55. Um, you will see we don't have something from Chrysler or from Dodge yet, um, but we'll get to that story a little bit later on. And then if you want to talk big four, you actually have Nash. So Nash is actually going to beat everybody to the sports car race. They come out with the Nash Healy in 1951. Um, it's a beautiful sports car, and they change it up in 1953. So this was basically a pairing between the American company and the British company. So American is Nash, Healy is British. You get the Nash engine from the factory in Wisconsin, which is shipped to Britain to receive that Healy chassis. And then it, starting in 1953, they actually have them bodied by Panin Farina, who used to body for Ferrari. So this wasn't an uncommon thing at this time. You actually get a lot of American companies that are sending their cars to European coach builders in order to get that style um, and to make their cars look a little bit different. And so Nash is one of those. So that's a beautiful Nash Healy sitting there in front of you and we'll see another one a little bit later on. What you also see, um, not only are the American sports cars that are coming out, the European imports, what you're also going to get is independence. And we actually have three right here that have some pretty um, unique stories to them. So following along with our sports car story, you actually get a 1954 Kaiser Darren. Now the Kaiser Darren came out in 1953. It's actually the first fiberglass bodied car in America. So this actually beat the Corvette to it. So you're starting to use some of that new technology that we're gonna see after the war. Now this was built by Kaiser, but designed by Howard Dutch Darren, whose wife actually had her door taken off in a traffic accident. She had suicide doors. 
Uh, she opened it up this way without paying attention to what she was doing. So you open your door backwards, you're not looking. Somebody came by and just swiped the door right off. So his design solution is actually pocket doors. So you get these adorable little doors here that slide with the car. Unfortunately, with the way they're designed, um, if you got even a piece of sand in that track down there, the door would jam. Another thing to note about this car was it actually had a three position roof. So you could put the top all the way up, you could have it down, or you could have it somewhere in the middle. And so it would sit barely right above here. Well, once you had the door or the roof sitting right about here and your door down here, you actually have very little room to get in and out of the car. So you're kind of leaning into it. When you're sitting down, you have very little leverage to move the door. So basically the design was not super well thought out. They ended up only building about 450 of these models before they ended production. So this is filling that desire for sports cars, but coming out of the war, we're gonna see a lot of innovation and a lot of change. And you get uh, manufacturers who are very focused on safety instead of speed or performance. And so this is a 1948 Tucker. Designed by Preston Tucker, it was supposed to be very innovative, um, very safety driven. So it's a rear engine vehicle. You get a padded dashboard uh, in case of an accident. The windshield will actually, uh, actually pop out. It's one of the first cars we have to feature seat belts. Um, and that was actually so rare that um, it was only an option that you could put in the vehicle. They wouldn't let him put it in every production vehicle. If you come to the front, you actually see it has three headlights. So this Cyclops headlight here in the front was a feature that he added. He wanted tiller steering um, that actually steered with the car, but they told him it wouldn't be possible. So the Cyclops headlight actually does steer with the car. And so as you take a corner, you have light to lead your way. Now, Preston Tucker, like all startups, basically had this idea wanted to promise something big and, and get it working, but he had a hard time getting money uh, and a hard time getting resources. So he was stymied for steel. He um, had a hard time getting engines. He ended up actually buying a leftover military hangar, basically in Chicago, where he was able to get steel um, as well as helicopter engines for his vehicle. Um, so it is a heli helicopter engine. Started out air-cooled, but eventually went water-cooled. Um, but the other thing that he used to do in order to get people to kind of get excited about this car is he made a lot of promises about what would be available. Um, and he also used to paint his cars different colors uh, to kind of prove that he was in production more than he actually was. So he would take the car out, um, put it at an auto show as one color, and then he would take it home, paint it a different color, take it out to the next auto show, and it looked like a brand new model. And through this, he was able to kind of prove that he was in production. Unfortunately, that triggered some red flags at the SEC. He actually put, uh, had several counts of fraud put out against him. Uh, they thought he was defrauding investors. He ended up going to court. He had to build uh, 51 models, basically, to prove that he was in production. He actually managed to do that. Um, he built all 51 paraded him around the courtroom and eventually was proven innocent. But by that point, he was completely bankrupt. And so there were only 51 models of the Tucker ever built. There are still 48 out in the world driving around, which is incredibly impressive. Um, and this car here, we believe to be one of Preston Tucker's personal cars that he actually used. And so you can see it has actually his family insignia here on the side of the car um, to designate it as one that him and his family would have used. Um, so Safety, performance, who knows, right? You get to the Davis Devan. This is another independent that's coming out of the time period from 1948. This car was designed by Gary Davis and his idea was to build a car of the future. And so you get basically this three wheeled vehicle with one wheel in the front, two wheels in the back, which makes it incredibly unstable. In addition to that, you have one bench seat um, now he advertised this as a four person family car. So you were supposed to be able to fit four people in one row going down the side of the car here and take a long distance road trip and be okay with that. Now he actually used flight attendants in his marketing campaign. So if you think about like Pan Am models from the 1950s, he's able to fit four or five of them in a row, snap a picture, even then the girls are pretty tight in that car. And since that's no one's average American family, his marketing campaign completely failed. Now, this ended up being a huge failure for uh, Gary Davis. He 
had bought a hangar in Van Nuys, was starting to produce cars, um, and he promised all of his investors that he would pay them back after he sold all of his vehicles. Now he went into production, nobody wanted to buy this thing, so he ended up building maybe 16 cars total before going out of production, and uh, he ended up going to jail for fraud. So in the case of the Devan and the Tucker, you have two um, designers, innovators, people who are trying something new, who have to overpromise in order to actually get money to get started. And in both cases, um, they kind of ended up not going anywhere. And so today there's only a few Devan left in the world, there's only a few Davis left in the world. But they're very interesting stories to look at how um, uh, something like a war can actually bring about radical change in our design. Um, now, as we go down the row here, you will be looking at a few things. Um, remember, we talked with the Nash Healy about um, American companies taking their cars to uh, European coach builders. You have here a 1953 Cadillac, um, which is bodied by Ghia. They only bodied two Cadillacs in 1953, and this one was purchased by Prince Ali Khan, who was the richest man in the world at the time. Now, he bought this as an I'm sorry, please don't divorce me gift for his wife, Rita Hayworth. They did not have the greatest relationship. Unfortunately, the car did not work. Um, she ended up divorcing him, but she got to keep the car. And if you look right behind it, you have a Plymouth, uh, which is also bodied by Ghia. So two American cars, bodied by the same Italian company, and you can really see the similarities in the styling, but this is the Americans basically trying to offer as many options as they possibly can, um, which was not uncommon. You saw that with a company like GM, um, even before the war. They were big on uh, consumer availability, giving them as many choices as possible, and that brings us to our Chevy Bel Air, which is probably one of the most ingeniously designed cars coming out of America. Um, this was designed by Harley Earl. Now, he went on to be head of design at GM, designed the Corvette, um, designed the LaSalle, which we saw on another tour. Uh, and basically, Harley Earl, his family was actually from Los Angeles. They had a coach building business here in LA, um, which he was very endeared to LA. So he actually designed this car as a tribute to the city that he loved. And so you get um, things like the Bel Air name, which is a neighborhood here in Los Angeles, the convertible top, which is incredibly popular because we have such sunny weather. And he did everything he possibly could to design this car to look as fast as it possibly could. And so you get things like fins on the back of the car. Fins don't actually do anything to make this car faster uh, aerodynamically, but they make it look really cool. You get this white stripe going all the way down the side of the car, outfitted with chrome. Now, this is the year that we start to see freeways in the United States, 1956. That's when the freeway system is going to start to be built. And what you have is an ease of movement. People are going faster, they're going farther. That white line outlined in chrome is going to make you look like you are shooting forward like an arrow, even if you're only going 40 miles an hour on the freeway. It's an incredible detail. You also get things up at the front here by the hood to kind of trick your eye and give you a, a kind of an idea of, oh, maybe this car is faster than I think. You get an airplane, airplane hood ornament, right? The front bumper, which looks like the front of jet engines. So all of these little details that all together kind of culminate in, oh, maybe this car is actually faster than I think. And so suddenly, when we're looking at post-war America, it's a time of consumerism, it's a time of expansion. People have money, they want to be spending time with their families, and they're out on the road because we have these new freely built interstates. And so you get these big cars, very comfortable seats to be able to take long road trips, right? Everything to make it look fast, even though it's just a family car. So it's just really ingeniously designed. So um, we've talked about the big three, some of the cars that they're coming out with uh, during this period. You looked at independence, right, and, and those kinds of things. Um, we will move over to look at European models, but one of the other things that you start to see in the post-war period is hot rodding and customization. Now, this is gonna be a completely other tour, so if you're a big hot rodder customizer, please check that tour out, but we're gonna touch on it briefly because you can see here we have a lot of customs and hot rods in our collection. To start out with, um, few low riders here on the side. As you pan all the way down, um, we do have amber winners, um, and those will all be touched on in a later 
uh, tour. But basically, hot rodding is gonna come about in the post-war period because people are seeing these small independent sports cars, but maybe they can't afford them, and so what they're going to do is actually customize their own vehicles. They're gonna take their cars from the 30s, they're going to modify the engine, change the outside, and create these custom cars that can actually go out and race. And so where they may not be able to afford a race car that you would be able to buy from a major company, perhaps they can take their old car from the 30s and 40s and actually customize it themselves and take it out and race it. So again, please go back and check our website. You'll be able to find that hot rodding performance tour um, where you'll be able to see a lot of these customs in detail and hear their stories. Um, now, a few more customs actually we're gonna talk about real quick before we move on um, that we're just gonna touch on. You have uh, Blind Faith here, which is black, half black, half white. So this is a Chevy El Camino that's been customized. It was customized by a guy named Harry Bentley Bradley, who was um, initially a designer at GM himself um, and helped design the Chevy fleet side, um, which later became inspiration for the Hot Wheels toys. Um, basically, Harry Bentley Bradley designed the first 16 Hot Wheels, did them all based on cars that he had worked on at GM, um, and so you get that vibe kind of from this car sitting here in front of you. And then he ended up leaving Mattel because he didn't think it was gonna take off. So kind of a mistake on his part, but you can see that's an idea of a custom kind of later in the 60s, early 70s. Touching on cars being used for the interstate. So just like the Chevy Bel Air, you also get customs that are not necessarily just built for racing. And so you have here in front of you the Bosley Interstate. Now, this car was designed and built by Richard Bosley, who was a horticulturist. He studied plants. He had no design or engineering experience whatsoever. And he purchased a Jaguar, um, and he was very excited about this car when it came to him and he was bragging about it to his mom who drove an Oldsmobile. She got sick of listening to him, so she challenged him to a race. And basically, he lost, the Jaguar lost to the Oldsmobile, and he was so upset that he went on to build his own race car. Now, that was the Bosley Mark I, um, which we have in the museum. It's up on the, the third floor of the museum, so if you're ever able to come in, hopefully you'll be able to see that. But he eventually traded that car for a Corvette SR2 chassis, which he actually used in this vehicle here. And he designed this specifically to drive on the interstate. It was a car that was supposed to be very aerodynamic, very clean, very comfortable, so that you get up to speed on interstate, interstate the way that you would want to. And so basically this is just showing you anyone can build a hot rod, anyone can build a custom, um, and they don't all necessarily have to be per for, for performance. So now, if you'll follow me this way, we are actually going to take a look at some of our early European models um, coming out of World War II. Again, anything that you're seeing <laughs> off to the side that looks interesting to you, um, it should come up in another tour. You should be able to find it. Um, please feel free to watch all of our content online. And we are going to come to probably my favorite company, if not my favorite car in the entire museum, Citron. So this is a French company. They actually are going to start um, building cars in France before World War II, and so they are a pre-war company, and that's actually your type A here. Citron, Andre Citron was very innovative, um, very technologically advanced, and a lot of his cars were kind of the first of something in France. And so you have the type A here, which is from 1919, and it's outside of our time period that we're discussing, but um, this is the first uh, mass-produced vehicle in France, in Europe. So this is Europe's Model T. Um, and you can see it very much looks like the Model T, especially if you watched our pre-war vehicle. And one of my favorite things about it is the fact that the horn goes through the windshield. As you can kind of see it, you honk it here and it, <laughs> the noise comes out the front here. It's such an interesting design feature. Um, anyway, Citroen is gonna go on to be very innovative. Um, he's the first to introduce uh, mass production of front wheel drive in Europe, which early front wheel drive in America was not great. And so he's mass producing it around the same time that it's coming out in America. 
And that eventually brings us to the 2CV, which is this little blue car here in front of you. Um, so this was actually a passion project of Pierre Boulanger, who took over Citron after they went bankrupt in 1934. Um, he actually came from Michelin of Michelin Tires. They purchased the company. And Pierre Boulanger wanted to make a car for rural France. And so he had a few stipulations about this car. It had to be powerful enough to take 100 pounds of produce to market. And so it had two engines, one on each axle. They were both 12 horsepower to start out with, so 24 horsepower total. The suspension on it had to be so good that you could put a basket of eggs on your front seat, drive over an unplowed field, and never break an egg. And it had to be tall enough that you could climb into the car without having to remove your hat. And so it came out to be a very cheap, very inexpensive, very quickly built car that was very effective for rural farmers and rural doctors in France. And he was so adamant that it could only be used by people in rural France that he would actually send people to their homes to check and make sure that they were rural farmers or rural doctors um, and able to use this car. And uh, Citroën was actually a socialist company and they had about 250 of these prototypes in France when World War II broke out. Now, Citroën did not want these cars being used for the Nazi war effort, so they actually hid all 250 prototypes. And it took them until about 1994 to find three of them. That's how well they were hidden, um, which I always think is incredibly impressive. Now, this is a 1966 2CV Sahara. So production on this car officially starts in 1948, and it is going to continue unchanged through the early 1990s. And so no matter what model of 2CV you bought, it pretty much looked like this. <laughs> and it, they're supposed to be horrible to drive in terms of you're riding around, it's rattly, it's bumpy, um, but it's one of those cars that you could tip it head over end going down a hill and it would just land on its tires and keep driving, right? So it's supposed to be incredibly um, durable. So. One of my favorite cars, probably the one I would drive out of here with if I could. Um, next to it here is another Nash Healy. So we kind of already walked through the Nash Healy story, um, but this one you can actually see is the convertible top. And this one is famous. Uh, it was used in the original Sabrina film. Uh, it was driven by Audrey Hepburn. It was also Superman's car. Technically, you shouldn't say that. It was Clark Kent's car. So this was uh, Clark Kent's excuse as to how he beat everybody to the crime scene. It's not that he's Superman and he can fly there, it's that he actually has an incredibly fast sports car. So just a beautiful example, again, of one of those Nash Healy's coming out of America. Um, but that will actually bring us to a few more companies here um, coming out of post-war Europe. So coming out of the war, um, you have the start of a few major companies like Ferrari, who starts in 47. Um, Porsche has begun at that point, but they're gonna start importing to the United States in 48. Um, and then you have like Fiat, um, some of the French coach building companies. You also get smaller companies like Cheese Italia. So this is a 1947 Cheese Italia um, 202 Coupe. And basically you can see we're hitting a huge shift in our styling. Um, when you're before the war, cars are basically individual parts that are put together. With this car, you can see the whole body is basically one piece. Very few lines. It's not a trunk and a hood and a body put together. It's, it's one clean piece of metal that has been built for the car. Um, and this was bodied by Panin Farina, who bodies Ferrari. So Cheese Italia was a smaller Italian company. They're coming out of war-torn Italy where factories were destroyed due to bombing and they're starting to make small, affordable cars. So they actually license cheap Fiat parts in order to make the cars more affordable. But again, you get the beauty of coach building from Panin Farina. Now these cars are seen as modern sculptures and four of them were actually on display at the Museum of Modern Art in New York um, as such, as moving sculptures. And so I think they still have one permanently in their exhibit, um, but this is one of the ones that would have been on display at that time. You have next to it, a Fiat if you can believe it. Um, this is the Fiat 8V, bodied by Ghia, again, another Italian coach builder, in the supersonic body style, which is supposed to look like the airplane jet of the age. Now, Ghia used the term 8V instead of V8, because it does have a V8 engine in the car. Um, however, they believe that Ford had licensed the term V8, and they weren't allowed to use it. Uh, and so you get 8V instead for all of their V8 engine cars. Next to that is a beautiful Delahaye from 1953. 
Now, if you watched the pre-war American video, I talked a little bit about the French Art Deco style, and that's gonna be really big in the interwar period. Delahaye was a supreme designer in doing the French Art Deco style, and this car is really the end of Delahaye as a company and the end of the style. So you still get these kind of pronounced fenders that stick out from the car. You get two-tone paint, right, which is very indicative of that French Art Deco style, but it is less pronounced. The fenders don't stick out as much as they would have in the early interwar period. And so what you're seeing is coming out of the war, most of these French companies aren't able to withstand um, the economic disaster coming out of the war. And so they are actually going to collapse, crumble, basically come down to nothing. And so Delahaye, um, Delage, Bugatti, they all end up going out of business uh, in this post-war period. So you see kind of the downfall of some of these luxury coach-built cars, but really the rise of kind of what we think of luxury today. And so you get to Porsche, and we actually have kind of the story right here. To start out with, um, you have the Volkswagen Beetle. Okay, this is a very well-known car, especially here in America, but this actually came about before World War II, it was a car that was commissioned by Hitler to be for the German people. And so it was basically supposed to be a national car company, very cheap resources, right? You want a smaller car, less metal used because all of that is being used to gear up for the war effort. Um, now, Ferdinand Porsche actually had a hand in designing the Volkswagen Beetle. And so he kind of gets his start designing cars for Germany before the war. From the Beetle, moves over to the Type 64, which is gonna be the first Porsche, and eventually starts producing um, his first model that is gonna be sold to the public, which is the 356. And so that's gonna come about and start to be imported to the United States um, in the late 1940s, moving into the 50s. So you have here a very rare Porsche 356, and that is because this is actually called the Porsche Continental. And if you come on the side of the car, you can actually see it has the Continental name badge on it here. Now, when Porsche started selling cars in America, their marketing guy, Max Hoffman, who also came up with Herbie the Love Bug for the Volkswagen Beetle to kind of um, let everyone kind of forget about where it came from and kind of re-energize it, he convinced Porsche that Americans wouldn't buy cars that were numbered. And so the 356 wasn't going to sell. And so they came out with the name Continental instead for the Continental United States. Well, this is in the mid 1950s. If you can think about it, you probably know a company that has a car called Continental, right? It's Ford. Ford came out with a Lincoln Continental and in the mid 1950s, they were actually trying to uh, launch Continental as its own luxury brand coming out of Ford. And so they immediately took Porsche to court, forced them to change it. And so the Continental gets renamed for a brief period of time, the European, again, that doesn't work. And so they just go back to the 356. And so this is one of few 356s that still has that Continental name badge on the side. Now, eventually Porsche um, is going to desire a new model. And so moving into 1963, they actually come out with their follow-up model, which was initially gonna be called the 901, later gets renamed to the 911. And so we have here a 911, that is going to be um, the six-cylinder air-cooled engine, right? It's a rear engine vehicle. The 911 model, um, the following year, they decide to come out with a low-budget version, which is actually going to be the 912, um, which you get here. It's actually um, basically the 911 body with the 356 engine in it. So instead of the six-cylinder, you get the four-cylinder rear, rear, rear engine air-cooled um, model, and it's a lot cheaper. And so you get kind of the style of the 911, but with that 356 engine. And historically, the 912 is actually outsold the 911. Um, Porsche didn't think it would be as popular, but it ended up actually kind of proving them wrong. Uh, as we move down, you do have a 72 Ferrari 356 GTC 4 plus 4. Um, not much to say about this car. It wasn't as popular um, probably as they wanted it to be, but it gives you an idea of Ferrari kind of in the mid 70s. Ferrari is gonna start in 1947 with the 125S, um, which we actually have here and you should see in a later tour. 
Um, and he's basically building race cars. He doesn't want to build cars um, for passengers, for the consumer. And so throughout his time, you kind of see some of those consumer vehicles come out, but they're never as popular. Now, the one we do want to get to is the Dodge Storm. So we talked earlier about the big three coming out of World War II, and they are retooling, they're trying to come out with new designs, and what they come out with initially is going to be a two-seat sports car, because that's what everybody wants, that's what everybody's importing from Europe, and so you get the Corvette from Chevy uh, in 1953, designed by Harley Earl. Um, the follow-up to that from Ford is gonna be the Thunderbird in 1955, um, and actually the Thunderbird ends up being way more popular than the early Corvette. The early Corvette wasn't super popular. But what we don't see is a car coming out from Chrysler, coming out from Dodge. Um, and so they did have a prototype. It was the Dodge Storm, which you're seeing right here in front of you. Unfortunately, this car was way too expensive, way too difficult to build. Um, and it just ended up kind of never going into production. And you don't see a two seat sports car come out from Porsche, from Porsche, sorry, excuse me, from Dodge until 1992 when they come out with the Dodge Viper. And let's see, we're only at 30 minutes. Keep going. Okay, we're gonna keep going because I talk too fast. So that's going to bring us to a few more models over here. Um, we do have a whole other section of vault down here. So again, you can see, hopefully you'll be able to come in at one point and actually um, get a tour because there's so much down here and it's impossible to cover everything. Um, you do have a few models of Ford that we're actually going to talk about here. And these are all mid 50s Fords. So you get the Thunderbird in 55. I, uh, in addition to that, Ford is completely redesigning their mid engine kind of mid sized vehicle. And so you get things like the 1954 Ford Crestline, um, which is very obviously similar to the Chevy Bel Air. You're getting things like longer bodies, more comfortable seating, um, custom interior, that kinds of thing. As we come up the side here, we actually have four more that we're going to talk about in detail, a little bit more detail. Um, this is a good point to say the Peterson's um, have both passed away and since they've passed the museum um, is not out to purchase any vehicles um, We do not want to add to the collection um, That way we do however still take donations and so these Fords that you're seeing all came together as one big donation uh, There were nine vehicles total and they were all mid 1950s Fords um, And so this is a way that our collection is still growing um, So we do have a 55 Ford Fairlane next to a 57 Ford Fairlane. Now, the interesting thing about the Fairlane is it's actually um, Ford's first hard top convertible. And so it actually is a convertible top that comes up um, and goes and retracts back. Uh, it was an interesting feature that was very new technology that was coming out from Ford at the time. Um, you can see all of these have a very interesting two-tone paint, that kind of red and cream, um, which was a very popular styling at the time. These all came from one collection, which is why they all kind of have um, that similar styling. But here you can actually see where that convertible top would come up, and it is a hard top convertible. Around the side here, you have the Ford Ranchero. Now, this is Ford's first utility car, and it actually came out of Australia with the Utes. So you used to have vehicles that were utility-based only. Um, Ford actually got the idea because a pig farmer wrote into them and said that they wanted a car that they could take to church on Sunday and then haul their pigs away on Monday. So you need a car that is beautiful enough at the front to drive to um, church or out into town, but you need the utility of the back passenger trunk. Um, and so that's where the utility vehicle comes out. So the Ranchero comes out in 57 and that's gonna be Ford's first truck. And so if you're curious, if you're a big Ford truck fan, this is what you started with is your Ranchero right here. And then that is going to bring us to the Ford Thunderbird here on the end. This is a 62 model. So 
Looks a lot different from the 55 Ford Thunderbird, which is a lot smaller. You get that enclosed roof with the beautiful porthole windows. Um, eventually that is going to change. It's gonna become a lot more massive. And over time, the Ford Thunderbird is gonna lose its popularity because eventually it's going to become a four seat um, car, four seater. So instead of being a two seat sports car, it really turns into your family car. Um, now, little known fact, about me. <laughs> Growing up, I actually absolutely adored the Thunderbird. It is, it was the car of my dreams when I was a kid. And now working here, I would say that the early Corvettes are actually my favorite, one of my favorites. And so I've kind of flopped sides as I work here, but that's just an aside, fun little fact about me. Now, I think that is going to bring us to the end of our tour. Um, those are most of the, post-war vehicles that we have on display here. Um, anything else is just a smattering and you will be able to see it in many other tours. So please join us again, um, look on our website for any future details. And if you are enjoying any of this content, please consider giving us a donation. It's really helping us maintain all, being able to do all of this while we are closed. Um, but look forward to that. If you have children at home, we are doing educational live streams as well, and you can find all of that on the website. Um, so thank you so much for joining me and we'll see you next time.